Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We're very excited to have um, the second talk in our plenary speaker series. Um, the second speaker, our second speaker is going to be Priyam Patel. Uh, Professor Patel received her PhD from Rutgers in 2013, where she was advised by Feng Luo. Um, she previously held positions at Purdue and the University of California at Santa Barbara before joining the faculty at the University of Utah in 2019. Um, she is the recipient of numerous awards and grants, including most recently an NSF career grant, so congratulations. Uh, we are delighted that she will be joining us today to speak about infinite type surfaces and their isometry groups. So really quickly though, before Priyam gets started, so um, we're gonna um, give people the opportunity to ask talk, uh, ask questions live during the during Priyam's talk. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask. But after Priyam's talk at the end, we will do what we did in the first plenary talk, which is ask people to use the raise hands feature just so that we generate a queue. And just as a reminder for how that works, if you click, if you look at the reactions button at the bottom of your toolbar, Zoom toolbar, um, there's an option that says raise hand. So if you have a question at the end of the talk, we'll use that feature. And with that, Priyam, take it away. Okay. Um, first, thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. It's like a great pleasure to virtually be here. Um, and also a big shout out to the people who made all those postcards because I looked through them and they're so beautiful. <laughs> really, really nice. And I see like a ton of familiar faces in the audience. So hi to all of my people who are here. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to just start off with a quick advertisement which a lot of you like probably have seen floating around on Twitter. So in about exactly a year, um, this group of people, including myself, we're running a Roots of Unity workshop. So this is a workshop for um, really, it says women here, but it's more general than that. We The workshop is open to women, non-binary and gender fluid folks. And we'll focus on, the, the workshop is sort of focused around people of color. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know a lot of you are farther along in your careers, but if, if you or someone you know is in like years one through three of grad school, definitely please advertise this. Um, it's our first year running it. It is something that I put in my career grant and like these people like are the, the other organizers are all people I admire quite a lot. So I feel very honored to be a part of this. Um, but yeah, if you ever have any questions about it, feel free to email me and the application should be open around October or so, but we'll keep you updated on that. Okay, so oh, let's Priyam, start. I just put the link in the chat. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I, I maybe I'll just say like, there's definitely some like people here that I know know some things about infinite type surfaces, but that's the talk is not geared towards you experts in the audience. It's geared towards people who are have never heard of this stuff or are like really new to the field. I see that one of my undergrads is here too. So um, yeah, I, I'm just saying that there's gonna be a lot of intro in the beginning and then I'll get towards some results in towards the end of the talk. Okay, so throughout the entire talk, S is gonna be connected and orientable. Okay, a lot of the times it's also gonna be boundaryless, but I'm not gonna make that restriction in the beginning because I'm about to put down a surface with boundary. Um, so just a first definition, a surface is a finite type. These are the ones that people typically have thought about the most if the fundamental group is finitely generated, okay? An equivalent definition to this for finite typeness is that the surface is homeomorphic to a compact surface with finitely many points removed. So those are the pictures you're gonna see in just a second. And then otherwise a surface is of infinite type. And of course, since you saw the title, that's what this talk is mostly gonna be about. Um, but here are just some examples so these are surfaces of finite type, the ones that you see that people have been studying for like 100 years or more. So the first one is a genus two surface. So there's two donut holes and like this is, you know, hollow on the inside like that. So it's just genus two, no boundary components and no punctures. So a puncture is when you just removed a, a certain point. Um, the second surface is a genus three surface and it has no boundary components, but it has these two removed points, these punctures. And then the third one has two uh, genus two, three, maybe I should go in order, genus two, one boundary component, and then three punctures here. Okay, so when I list the surfaces like this, that suggests that there's an up at, uh, like a classification for them, right? These three numbers seem to sort of characterize um, what finite type surfaces are, and that's actually true, okay? So this is the 
classification of finite type surfaces. I didn't put a date on this because closed surfaces, the classification has been known for like a, over like 150 years or so. Um, and then uh, the classification for surfaces with punctures and boundaries follows pretty closely after that. So um, every finite type surface is classified up to homeomorphism by this triple, the genus, the number of boundary components, and then the number of punctures. Okay, and now we're going to transition to infinite type surfaces, which are a little bit more complicated, but still fun and beautiful. Um, here are a bunch of pictures, and I'm going to go through them uh, one by one just to give you an idea of what's going on. Okay, so the first surface, and of course, I chose all the ones with cute names. The first surface is a Loch Ness Monster surface. This is an infinite genus surface countably infinite genus surface, where your donut holes are going off to one side at infinity, right, or one end. The latter surface is a second example, and this has infinite genus again, but your genus is sort of tracking out to two different ends of the surface or two different ways of going off to infinity. The third surface I've drawn in two different ways. This is the flute surface. So like, I don't know, you imagine that this is actually the one you play. So I should have probably put it here, but um, it's like an infinite flute where you puncture the surface a countable number of times. And that sequence of points is accumulating onto one point, which is also like a point at infinity in some sense. And so these I've just drawn as like your typical cusps that you see on finite type surfaces sometimes um, where really when you draw it like this in the second, in the bottom case, you're putting a, a hyperbolic metric on the surface and that's what's a complete hyperbolic metric. And that's what's making these sort of punctures look like they're off at infinity in the, in the cusp sense. To get to one of those removed points, you'd have to go infinitely far in the surface, okay? Um, any questions on those three so far? Okay. Fourth surface is just here to show you there's, there can be a mix, right? You can have the ladder surface that you had before and just add a couple of punctures. You could add a lot of punctures, like trekking out to one end or trekking out to both ends here too. Um, so the mixing is fine. And the same thing here with uh, example five, this is a genus three surface, where again, you've removed this like sequence of points that's accumulating onto some point that's also removed from the surface. Okay, just to show you that things can be infinite type and be drawn to look like very sort of small, <laughs> okay? Um, six is one that I've added in recently. So I'm sure a billion people have seen me put up the slide, but it's been edited slightly from the last time. Um, this is a surface that I've been thinking about a lot lately. So it's here, it's like the flute surface, but instead of taking the sequence that's sort of accumulating onto one point out here, you take like a sequence that's accumulating onto one point here and a sequence that's accumulating onto one point here. And you remove that from this sort of, this is a cylinder, okay? And then come the fun examples. So what is this uh, canter tree surface? So I've drawn the skeleton of how I construct this, where you take this trivalent tree, okay, you thicken it, and then you just take the boundary. And so now I'm going to remove the tree. This is not a part of the actual surface, but it's how you see the surface being constructed. And so why is it called this canter tree surface? It's because the boundary of a tree, the boundary at infinity of a tree, is a canter set. Okay, so the number of ways of going off to infinity in this surface, this canter tree surface, is a canter set's worth of ways of going off to infinity. Okay, so that seems pretty distinct from some of these examples where there was only like a countable way of going off to it. Like you only had countably many options of if you wanted to walk out infinitely far in the surface, this becomes like something quite distinct, okay? And then eight is the blooming or blossoming canter tree. So what I've done is that skeleton that I had before of the tree sitting here, wherever I saw an edge, I'm just gonna stamp in a genus. And so here's one, here's one and so on. Okay, and that just keeps going off forever. And these two feel distinct because if I'm living on the surface and walking out in one of them, yes, I have a canter set's worth of ways in either surface. But in one of them, I'm gonna see genus every so often as I trek out forever and ever. Okay, so these feel sort of distinct and that's the distinguishing property. Okay, any questions on these surfaces? So um, 
infinite type surfaces arise naturally in a lot of contexts. So they have lots of connections to like um, quasi conformal maps. They arise like this one you've probably seen like in Hatcher before. Um, it arises as like a cover of a finite type surface, right? So they arise very naturally, um, but they are far less studied, far, far less studied than these finite type surfaces that I, I showed you before. So I'll tell you a little bit more of like um, the history, but let's just talk a little bit more of formalizing infinite type surfaces. So I keep talking about like going off to infinity and that's clearly not a rigorous math way of talking about something. So what I'm really talking about here is the ends of the surface. Okay, so if you've ever seen the ends of any sort of space, a graph, this, whatever, um, it's basically the same definition, right? It's a formal way of talking about how you exit a surface. You can use an exiting sequence. You can use complementary components of the compact exhaustion. It's all the same ways of formalizing going off to infinity. So I'm not gonna give you the definition that's not worth your time right now. But the one thing I, I want you to know is that um, when you take this set of ends, there's an extremely natural topology on it that makes it into a totally disconnected, metrizable, separable topological space. And um, if you put all these adjectives together for a topological space, what you actually can say is that uh, this is a uh, closed subset of a Cantor set. Okay, so that's a exercise for undergrads for our, when they're taking a points at topology class. One of my students actually did their like final video project on this result, which was really nice. Um, but yeah, that's you, you'll start seeing Cantor sets like floating around everywhere when you think about infinite type surfaces. And this is partly why, okay, because every single infinite type surface, its space of ends is actually a closed subset of a Cantor set, okay? And then I was already hinting at this before, but there are different types of ends. So there are these sort of ones where you see genus everywhere when you trek out to infinity, and then you don't. So those are the, the sort of older term for it is accumulated by genus. And by old, I mean like five years ago, <laughs> instead of like what people are starting to use now. But in a lot of papers, we'll start seeing this replaced with non-planar ends. It's just shorter and a little easier to digest. So these are the ones that you'll see genus as you go out farther and farther. And then of course, the other part of that is a planar end, right? If you just have um, an end where if you take a little neighborhood, it looks like a subset of the plane. That's what a planar end is, okay? The end is sort of like consisting of planar surfaces. So there is a very important subspace of the space of ends, and you have to keep track of it. So in general, you'll see this having a little bit of different notation, but the easiest notation is epsilon g. This is the closed subset of non-planar ends or ends accumulated by genus. Okay, so you have your whole end space, but then you have this special space, which is how many ends accumulated by genus you have or non-planar ends. So I'm gonna go back for a second to the previous slide to show you a picture to tell you what the end space of like one surface is that I have, okay? So here with the ladder surface with two punctures, I have two ways of trekking out to infinity that are non-planar. So that's two points. And then I have these two planar ends. So the end space actually consists of just four discrete points. Okay, so of course the end spaces for other things that are much more complicated. Here I have a Cantor set's worth of ends, right? The end space is actually a Cantor set. So that's just something to keep in mind. They could be very simple or extremely complicated. Okay, and this is not even as complicated as it gets. These are the pictures that I've drawn. So the end spaces are actually really manageable. Okay, um, and that's also part of the caveat, which is that I infinite type surfaces in general, you're not always gonna be able to draw one of them. Right? These are the ones that are pretty, so I draw them. But um, these are pretty tame in, in a literal sense and in a figurative sense. Okay, so all this is so that I can tell you the classification of infinite type surfaces. So we had one for finite type surfaces. It's quite simple. Here is the classification for infinite type surfaces. So this is a theorem of Carrick-Jarto and Richards. Carrick-Jarto wrote a proof earlier, but they had a gap in it and Richards filled it in oh. in 63. Priyam, I yes. think that we, if you oh. are, it's not yeah. updated. No, yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop. I, I probably should have updated my Zoom before. Um, 
like, how would they not figure this out by now? Everybody's working from home. No one wants to deal with this, but yeah, now you can see. Now you can see. Great. Thank you. Yes. Oh, so I didn't, so you didn't see me go back to the surface? No. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. It's totally fine. So I was just saying that this surface, the ladder with two punctures, there's two ends that are non-planar and then two ends that are planar. So those are actually, that's, that's the whole end space. It's four points. And then in this example, the end space is a cantor set. It's much more complicated. Okay, so I was slipping back and forth. It was cute, but it's fine. You didn't miss much. Okay, so here's a classification theorem. Uh, like I said, Caracciardo wrote a proof. Uh, Richards filled in the little gap that was there. So it says that an infinite type surface is determined up to homeomorphism. Instead of by some triple, it's by this four tuple, okay, which is the full space of ends this important subspace of uh, non-planar ends, the genus, which actually can be, of course, now infinity, right? So this is in, I don't know what the convention is, but here I'm just going to assume natural numbers have zero. Okay, so it's something in here. So it's either a finite number, zero, fi fi finite number, or it's countably infinite. And then B is the number of compact boundary components. So this is number of compact uh, boundary components. Okay, so um, this is the simplest classification in the sense that it's the most restrictive, actually. If you wanted to allow for a non-compact boundary, there's a more complicated classification. And of course, since a bunch of us have started thinking about infinite type surfaces, people are starting to push that now and start thinking about non-compact boundary. It, sh it should be very important, but it's, it's quite a bit more complicated. You have to keep track of a little bit more information. Okay, so this seems really great because, well, you have a classification. So for instance, that tells us that this surface, seven, the Cantor tree surface, so this means that seven is the same as the sphere minus the Cantor set. Because if you keep track of everything, the end spaces are correct. They're both a cantor set. The non-planar ends, there are no none of them, right? There's no ends accumulated by genus. The genus is correct at zero and the number of boundary components is correct at zero. So this tells you actually like, oh, these two surfaces that I'm looking at are the same. And that's fantastic. But there are limitations with this classification, partly because you're saying that one of the components or two of them uh, you need to know the homeomorphism type of a closed subset of Cantor set. And classifying closed subsets of Cantor sets is very, very difficult. And so this is useful, but what you'll see is a more piecemeal approach usually with infinite type surfaces. It's hard sometimes, especially when you're working with the end space, it's hard to have a sweeping theorem where you're saying all infinite type surfaces have this property. Now those theorems exist, I'm gonna tell you about some of them, but now that we know a lot more and we have a little bit more structure with the end space that we can play with, we're starting to see a more piecemeal approach. That's just a caveat that I wanna put out there that when you see people saying, oh, I'm gonna restrict to infinite type surfaces of this type, it's not because they're just can't prove the theorem. It's because it really requires like a completely different approach sometimes. Okay, so that's mostly for like, uh, defending my young people in the audience that are working in this area. Like it's totally normal to have a result that has some restrictions. So um, yeah, that's sort of my crash course on infinite type surfaces. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions. Is okay. the classification for non-compact boundary as easily digestible? It's a little bit more complicated. Like you have to keep track of the way that the, there's like this name that I forgot, the way that they all sort of form a pattern in the, at infinity, the non-compact boundary components. There's like cycles in the, in the boundary that you have to keep, cycles in like the space at infinity that you have to keep track of. Um, but Ryan Dickman at Utah like has thought about this quite a lot. And so I would definitely ask him, like he's the one who taught me about what the classification is. And um, yeah, it's the kind of thing where like for me right now, I'm just like, oh, I don't want to think about this, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll be forced to think about it a bit more soon, but it's not, I think Riley, you would be, you would definitely be able to understand it. It's just, it's more complicated. Yeah. It's not just like you keep track of the number, for instance, right? It's, their configuration matters. 
Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. I, I think there was another question. Yeah. From Ying, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, if you have um, two surfaces that are both from a sphere, remove a counter space, they are not necessarily homeomorphic. Is that right? They are necessarily homeomorphic. They are not. They are a necessarily homeomorphic? They are necessarily homeomorphic. Uh, I'm going to avoid answering this question in any more detail because I know it's confusing that pe for people who think about Cantor sets that like if I take a sphere and I just take out a Cantor set, it should always be the same, but we're just, it's loose. It's homeomorphism. We're not talking about any geometric structure or anything like that. So it really is the same. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So like if I took a, a different tree or something, still it's a Cantor space of ends and it's all fine. Like those all have the same type end space. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit more later if you would like. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to start. Okay, so my title on my talk says like, and their isometry groups, but of course I'm going to mention the mapping class group. Okay, so <laughs> this is, um, this is now just a general overview of like things about mapping class groups for all types of surfaces. So the way you think about the mapping class group, it's the group group of topological symmetries. Okay, so what it is actually is the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms up to isotopy, which is the most natural equivalence relation that would exist in this setting. And so sometimes you see it denoted like this. So really it wouldn't be terrible if you were just like, I don't really wanna think about these equivalence classes. I'm just gonna think about homeomorphisms. That's okay for today's talk. You do wanna quotient out by isotopy to make everything work in a normal way. Like you don't wanna actually distinguish between those things when you're thinking about symmetries of surfaces. So I just noticed that I didn't put my newer notes on my computer, so I will just download them quickly and let you think for a second. <laughs> um, so the first few things I want to say about mapping class groups are that they're really, really, really important. Okay, for even just if you're talking about just think about finite type surfaces, like you never want to think about an infinite type surface in your life. That's fine, you don't have to. But even for finite type surfaces, I mean, understanding the topological symmetries of a space seems pretty important in and of itself. So if you wanna understand surfaces, you've gotta study this object, right, in some sense. And then of course they have like lots of connections to like algebraic geometry and the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And there's also tons of connections to three manifold theory. Okay, so a lot of that work is much more recent and it's due to like, really big contributions by Thurston, where for instance, if you know your mapping class, those that's what I call an element of the mapping class group is a mapping class. Um, if you know that it's like pseudo and also, so it has some sort of property, then you know that the mapping torus you create using that homeomorphism is hyperbolic. This is just like an amazing result, right? That you can actually say that. So I think the thing that I kind of want to emphasize here is that, you know, we, have been studying finite type surfaces for just so long. And part of that restriction comes from the fact that, well, we didn't know much about finite type surfaces, right? And now after all of these last, the last hundred years or so of advancements in, in just how much of a leap forward we've taken in understanding symmetries of surfaces and three manifolds, it like almost only makes sense to now say, well, I don't really need to restrict to finite type surfaces. Right, like that's a convenient restriction to put in place when you're beginning to study something. But I think as mathematicians, like this is what we do, right? We sort of generalize to the extent that we can and say, well, there was really no restriction, no reason to put that restriction except we didn't know what was going on, right? So that's part of the motivation that I wanna put out there for like why infinite type surfaces seem to be blowing up like right now. Um, and then of course, there was this blog post by Danny Caligari that like really sort of kicked off everything. I don't know how many years ago this is. I have to think about when I was a postdoc at Purdue. So they were talking about five years ago or so, five, six years ago. Um, he wrote this blog post talking about studying the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set. And he makes like tons of connections to dynamics. And that's like a really exciting thing, right? When you can see something that has like such deep connections between two, two fields that are slightly related. Um, and so that was really exciting. And I think 
when Julia Pavard wrote her paper answering the questions he put out on that blog, that again was like a big moment where we're like, okay, wait, we can actually start to study these. And from there, it's just kind of grown very quickly to the point where some of us are very afraid that the young people are proving theorems so fast. <laughs> it's like amazing how much momentum is sort of existing in this field right now. And I mean, I actually love it. It's not, I'm not actually scared, but it's, it is like, wow. Like when we were starting out, like when Nick Glamis and I wrote our first paper on this stuff, I mean, we just knew nothing, right? We're like, is this true? Like things that you think take for granted in the finite type surface world, they're just like, we're not true. So I, it's exciting to see how much has been done already just in the span of like five or six years. And I think that part of the other reason that the, these infinite type or big mapping class groups have become so popular is because they do have these connections to like really seemingly unrelated things, right? Like, okay, dynamics, great, there's a connection there. But Thompson's groups like show up in a deep way in a lot of infinite types uh, mapping class groups. And then there, there has been these new developments about connections to descriptive set theory, which again, feels a little odd, but um, in uh, the second paper I wrote with Nick and Javi Aramayona, we realized that a, a result that was proved previously could be used to show that these groups are Polish groups. And then you can leverage a lot of the machinery about Polish groups to understand infinite type mapping class groups. So if you're ever interested in that, the person in like set theories work that you should look at is Christian Rosendolf. And um, Kazarofi and Katie Mann have a great paper that's out now that like connects these two fields in a really deep way. So I think that that sort of richness is what is propelling this field forward so quickly. And I, you know, it's a plenary talk. I, I have to give you these sort of details. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm gonna say about um, why mapping class groups and why infinite type mapping class groups are important. And then um, my next slide is sort of a compare and contrast. Just for people who don't know a ton about the finite type surfaces and then what could be different in infinite type mapping class groups, I'm gonna go through a few similarities and differences in this slide. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this since I want to get to some theorems at the end. So if you're really interested in one of them, just stop me if I'm going too fast. The first thing that you want to know about any group is generation properties, right? So Priyam, did you change slides again? I did. See, when I stop for too long, I think it just like it forgets. Yeah, it does. It's like I should. Don't worry, we won't forget. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so there we go. OK, good. So that's the slide. Um, the first thing that uh, I said was you want to know if a group is finitely generated or not. Anybody who does geometric group theory is like, yeah, you put down the condition finitely generated group, and now you can do geometric group theory. So um, the mapping class group of a finite type surface is finitely generated. The mapping class group of an infinite type surface is an uncountable group. So it's not finitely generated, not countably generated. So things are big. Like they, that's why they call them big mapping class groups. I'm starting to call them infinite type mapping class groups. So if anybody wants to start calling them that, that's what I've been doing. But um, if you just want to see what's going on here. There's a very simple um, homeomorphism of a surface called a Dane twist, where you take a curve like this purple one. Sorry, I drew that so small. Let me zoom in a little. So you take this purple curve on the ladder surface and you kind of do like a two pi twist around that curve and glue it back in. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, but if I take all of these purple curves, okay, then the Dane twist about each of them, so let's call this one alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha minus one, and so on. If I do the Dane twist about each of those, that generates a copy of Z in my group. And because the curves are disjoint, they commute. So I actually have a copy of the bear specker group, Z to the N, the direct product of a countable collection of Zs, sitting inside of the mapping class group of this surface. So this is a very uncountable group. And so now you know that your group is uncountable. Okay, so um, it feels kind of like sad that that's true. It turns out that that's kind of what gives like mapping class groups some of their interesting properties too. So it's like a, it's a bittersweet sort of situation. Um, so if I'm gonna say a group is finitely generated, I wanna know what it's generated by. So in the finite type setting, it is generated by these really, really simple homeomorphisms. That's not to say that there aren't really complicated homeomorphisms of finite type surfaces. 
but generate for a generating set, you can describe it very simply. And like, I could show you a generating set on any surface that you were thinking of. And now if I'm talking about an uncountable group, yes, you can talk about generating sets, but a natural thing to do is maybe say, let's talk about topological generating sets. So there's a topology on mapping class groups, extremely natural one called the compact open topology. So I can think about these as topological groups. And I'm gonna think of topological generating sets. So countable dense subsets. And so infinite type mapping class groups are generated by Dane twists. And I put and here, but this is sort of a lie for some surfaces. What I mean to say here is, they're just not enough for a lot of surfaces. Some surfaces, you get topological generation of the pure mapping class group. Let's not worry about the word that I put in front there by Dane twist. But a lot of times you have to, you have to add in these other homeomorphisms called handle shifts, okay? If you don't understand everything that I'm saying right now, again, this is like an overview slide. So you could always go and deep dive into one of these things if you wanted to. So this is um, that first paper that I mentioned with myself and Nick Lamis. This is what we one of the things we proved in that paper. Okay, what is the next thing? If you're giving a talk as a geometric group theorist, you're gonna mention some space that this group acts on, right? So here I have the curve graph. You might've heard that at some point. It's just a very special graph associated to a surface. Um, it's hyperbolic. That means delta hyperbolic in the sense of Gromov. Okay, if you've never heard of that, great Wikipedia article, look that up. Um, and it's infinite diameter. Those are the two properties that you really want for a graph. When you have a group that you're interested in that, that, uh, that group is acting on. So here I have that the mapping class group acts on this graph and it's by isometries, like a super, super nice way. This action is one of the most fruitful things to study in this realm of research. It is extremely, extremely valuable. So the buzzkill on this side is that the curve graph is finite diameter. Okay, so that's not great when you're trying to understand dynamical properties of a group acting on a graph. You want it to have like infinite diameter. It's not terrible in the sense that you can still say some things that the mapping class group still acts on this by isometries. There are still like, there are still connections like that you can prove the appropriate Ivana meta conjecture results in this um, in this realm. But most of the time you're going to see people adjusting the graph. They're not going to use the curve graph because it's not like uh, complex enough, they'll replace this with another graph. And there have been results in the last couple of years, last few years, where using those graphs has become fruitful. So all hope is not lost. You can still do that sort of understanding of actions of the group on some hyperbolic space. Okay. But that's a difference for sure. Um, one similarity that I'll point out is that you have rigidity. Okay. So rigidity on one side, rigidity on the other. What this means is that if your underlying groups are the same, so if your groups, the mapping class group of S and S prime are isomorphic, then the underlying surfaces S and S prime are homeomorphic. Okay, so you can't have two different surfaces with the same mapping class group. Okay, and so this on the infinite type side was proved by Bavar, Dowdle, and Rafi in 2017. So I think, again, you're starting to see the dates here don't look that long ago, right? These are really, really recent um, results. Okay, that's fantastic, but but remember, these groups are really big. So saying like, oh, these two groups are the same, that gives the surfaces are the same. Maybe you wanna do something a little bit more careful. So on the finite type side, there's like a list of like four invariants, algebraic invariants, four algebraic properties that you can write down of the mapping class group that tell you the topology of the surface S. So it's like better than rigidity, right? You're saying, if I knew these few facts about the mapping class group, I can determine the genus, the boundary components and the number of punctures, okay? And now that's very important on the infinite type side because these groups are much bigger. So saying, oh yeah, the group determines the underlying surface, well, yeah, the group is really, really big. That's a lot of information that you're asking for. So you want to ask for something here. And there's not much known here. Okay, so I'll tell you more at the end of the talk. There's one case where we can handle it, but we don't know. And I think that's a really, really important question that we should be working on. Okay, so trying to come up with a finite list of invariants of the mapping class group that determines the surface, the underlying surface.
And of course, I have to mention the Nielsen Thurston classification. Okay, this is monumental. It is so important in finite type surface theory. You know from the Nielsen Thurston classification that every element of the mapping class group is periodic, reducible, or pseudo-anoxive. Okay, that's an actual classification. Um, and on the infinite type side, we have a big, big question marks. Okay, this is the biggest, in my opinion, open question for infinite type mapping class groups. Okay, so can we get towards a classification? Much more complicated. There's not gonna be these three nice categories. There's gonna be some extra work you have to do. Um, might be easier for some surfaces than others, but you know there are avenues that can get us towards that. And that is not what I'm gonna talk about today, even though in another talk, I might talk about some of my work related to that classification theorem. Okay, so yes, I'm going like running a little low on time. I'm gonna tell you about a theorem in a bit, but does anybody have maybe any quick questions about this slide in the comparison? If you ever want this slide, I mean, you could go back and watch the talk, I guess, but I can also just send this whole PDF to the organizers if, if you any of you want it, okay? We would love that. And also uh, Marissa points out in the chat that you will be leading an open problem session with Nick. Yes, that's right. So all of this, yeah, thank you, Marissa, for reminding me. This is kind of like, I almost didn't put this in the uh, side in the talk. I wanted to give like a really research talk, but I, I think like framing some of this stuff is really important, but we're basically gonna talk about all this stuff in the open problem session. So please come, okay? That's next week on the 23rd, I believe. So a week from, is it week? 20 seconds. I don't know. It's on Wednesday or Thursday. It's in the calendar. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I don't know my own calendar. I can't keep everything straight. <laughs> okay. So um, we're going to get to the actual like theorems now. Okay. So um, what I want to focus on instead of the mapping class group is the isometry group of a surface. So isometry is more rigid. It's the group of geometric symmetries. Geometry adds more structure to a topological space. And so here, what I need to do first is say, I'm gonna put some like complete hyperbolic structure on my surface. So I just fix S, it's some infinite type surface. I put a complete hyperbolic, uh, sorry, I wanted to write structure there. Structure or metric, whatever you wanna call it, on the surface. And I think now- it happened again. <sighs> I just Sorry, I, no, I think I'm not 100% sure, you, but I think you, it did. You. No, you definitely did because I was writing. So it, it's okay. That's my whole screen. And <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay. We're back. Okay. So, um, yes, what we want to do is study uh, take a surface, infinite type surface, or finite type one. I'm going to talk about general theory here for a bit but we're gonna put a complete hyperbolic structure on it. So you just take the complete hyperbolic metric, put it on your surface. And now I'm gonna study the isometry group. This is the group of isometries, which are rigid geometric versions of homeomorphisms, right? So the two questions that I wanna sort of address, and these are kind of a mouthful, so let me just go through them slowly. The first one is, if you're given a countable group, does there exist some complete hyperbolic surface where the isometry group is exactly that group G. So you give me your favorite finite, countable, whatever kind of group, finally generate a group. Um, and, and I'm gonna try to come up with a complete hyperbolic surface where that's the, exactly the isometry group of that surface. First question. Second question is just a little bit different. Let's say we fix a surface S and I look at all different metrics that I can put, all different complete hyperbolic metrics that I can put on the surface. Can I characterize all of the possible isometry groups? Okay, so what we say is that can be realized by some complete hyperbolic structure on the surface. Okay, and this is on the nose, like I saw isom of x is exactly g, is exactly that group. Okay, so I'm going to answer the first question with some previous work of other people. And then the second question is what I want to talk to you about at the end of the talk, which is quickly approaching. Okay, so here is a little bit of history. Um, for this first question, where you just want to come up, you just fix your group and you want to come up with some surface where that's the isometry group. There's this result of Alcock and Winkelmann, they proved this uh, independently, that you can, for any countable group, there does exist the surface. Okay, so there exists a complete hyperbolic surface where the isometry group is exactly G. When the group is finite, X is closed. That was known 
a long time ago. Okay, so by Greenberg in 72 for the finite group case. For the general case of countable groups, it's like I mean, much more recent, right? I don't even know how many years ago that is, but maybe five. Um, okay, so that's kind of the thing that started off, us off um, working on the next theorem that I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, so we saw Alcock's paper and his result is constructive. He takes a group and uses the Cayley graph to build a surface and then shows that the isometry group is exactly that for that surface. So he builds a surface, puts a specific metric on the surface, and then shows that there are no additional geometric symmetries except those exactly. So the isometry group is G. And it's, it's a great construction, but you can definitely wiggle things quite a bit, right? You can generalize this construction in, in many, many ways. And so for the second question, um, oh, actually, yeah, so here's the second question. So if we wanna characterize all possible groups, you're kind of thinking like how much flexibility is there in this construction, right? In this thing that Alcock did. So maybe the thing I wanna say is if you're trying to characterize all possible isometry groups for a surface, you need to do two things. First, for the groups G where it's possible, you wanna do this construction. Okay, so something like a generalization of Alcock's construction. But like, if there are some groups that you can't do that for, it feels like you can't make it work. You also need to know, like, is that true? Like, are there actual possible obstructions, right? Like if the group is not of this type, there's no chance for this surface, right? So those are the two things that you kind of have to tackle. So characterizing is an if and only if, right? And so this is the if and only if part of the statement. So uh, again, a bit of history on obstructions that there's this really old theorem of Hurwitz's in the finite type setting that for a compact genus G surface, your isometry group can only be so big. The order of that group is less than or equal to 168 times G minus one. So if you're looking for what do you mean by an obstruction, here's an obstruction, okay? And the one thing I wanna emphasize here is this is the only thing we basically know in most settings for compact surfaces. So this is the rare occasion where the next theorem I'm gonna tell you about is kind of amazing that you can prove it because in the finite type case, you can't say exactly, okay, yeah, I know that the groups have to be only, only so big, but what are they? Which finite groups of order less than 168 times G minus one can I get? That's a completely open question. Okay, so we don't know. And so for infinite type surfaces, the fact that we can get any type of answer, I think is actually kind of remarkable. Okay, any questions on that? Because I'm about to tell you the theorem. And now I also have a question for the organizers. Since we started at 11.04, may I go to 11.49? <laughs> of course you can. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna state the theorem piece by piece. It's only actually one part of the theorem because there's no way I can get through the whole statement of the theorem. But here it is. So this is um, with joint work with Tarek Algab and Nick Glamis. Um, I'm gonna put some restrictions down. So S is gonna be an infinite type surface, no planar ends, so no punctures, okay? And actually here I should have put boundaryless as well. Usually I'd put that restriction early on on the top. Okay, so it has no boundary. And now we just let G be any group, okay? So here is the part one of our theorem. It says that if the end space of the surface has this property called self-similarity, then there exists a complete hyperbolic structure on S where the isometry group is exactly G if and only if G is countable. So this is a complete characterization of all isometry groups for these types of surfaces. And in some sense, you should say there's no restrictions. Every single countable group can be realized. And that's again surprising as well. Okay, countability is a, a normal restriction. That's gonna just be the case for all surfaces. The, the isometry group has to be countable. I can tell you an argument for that another day. But this is part one of the theorem. Let me show you some surfaces that this applies to. So here are three, the Loch Ness Monster surface. So what is self-similarity, okay? This is mimicking the behavior of the Cantor set in some sense, where everywhere you look in a Cantor set, it looks like a Cantor set, self-similarity, right? You're similar to yourself. When you zoom in on certain parts, it looks like the whole space. Zoom in again on certain parts, it looks like the whole space. 
So that's loose, very loose. Of course, there's nothing to prove here in some sense about self-similarity. There's only one end. So it's of course self-similar because it's just a point, right? This one's a little bit more confusing. The end space is a sequence. And so here I'd actually, actually have to tell you the definition of self-similarity. The idea here is that um, in a little neighborhood of this point, you'll always see like a full version of the end space, okay? Anyway, that's not super important. It's a technical point, but I just wanted to show you that there are these surfaces, the three that I can draw. There's an uncountable collection of surfaces that satisfy this criteria, okay? There are two other parts of the theorem that do a full classification for all surfaces of this type. And they are more restrictive. In the other two settings, you're not gonna get every single countable group. Okay, so here's a corollary to this result. If S is infinite type, no planar ends, and you have a self-similar end space, so this is a surface of type star, then because you can always realize any countable group as the isometry group, Isometries are more rigid versions of homeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms, and mapping classes. So in each of these groups, you have an isomorphic copy of every single countable group. Okay, that's also surprising that any group even contains every countable group is kind of surprising. But then the nice thing, and I'm going to stop at this in a second, but the application I want to tell you about is that you can leverage that. If you know that your mapping class group has a copy of every single countable group, then you can get some property, some algebraic property that you know that these groups just can't have. Okay, so I'm gonna just pull this slide up and end here. But the idea is that there are these things called hereditary properties of groups. So if your big group has it, every subgroup has the property. Residual finiteness, right? Like residual finiteness, the Tietz alternative, coherence, linearity. If your big group is linear, every single subgroup is linear. So now if you know your mapping class group, contains a copy of every countable group. Well, it's going to contain a copy of a nonlinear countable group. And so the big group can't be linear because it doesn't have this, you know, otherwise the hereditariness of the property would tell you that, anyway, you get the point. So the corollary here is that you can leverage this result for a bunch of algebraic um, invariants of your mapping classes, uh, your mapping class groups. For the surfaces satisfying star, the homeomorphism, diffeomorphism, and mapping class groups are not linear, do not satisfy the Tietz alternative, are not residually finite, are incoherent. And then basically anything else where you can find a countable group that doesn't have a hereditary property, okay? There was another application that I'm definitely not gonna get to, but you can ask about it later if you want. So I'm gonna skip ahead of that and just say thank you. Oh, and it froze, so there you go. <laughs> Perfect timing though. <laughs> Let me reshare. <laughs> 